The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's free webinar, How to Raise Venture Capital, What's Your Plan? with Ryan Asleen of Stubbs, Alderton, and Mark Lees, and Gadiel Morantes from Early Growth Financial Services. My name is Gina Longmire, and I'm the Marketing Manager for Early Growth Financial Services, and I'll be your moderator today. This presentation will run about 40 minutes. If you have questions as we go along, please feel free to enter them in the question field, or you can tweet them to us at earlygrowthfs with the hashtag VCBelieve. Don't raise your hand if you have questions. Feel free to jump right in, and we'll get to them as they come along if we have time. If not, we will wait until the question and answer period at the end of the presentation. You'll also be receiving a follow-up email tomorrow with our presenters' emails and information to follow up with any other additional questions, as well as a link to the deck and this recording. I want to start by introducing our presenters. First, we're pleased to have with us Ryan Asleen from Stubbs, Alderton, and Mark Lees, LLP. Ryan is a partner with Stubbs Alderton and serves as director of the firm's pre-accelerator program. Ryan advises a wide range of both clients focusing on emerging growth development stage and middle market technology and other companies, as well as the venture capital firms, angel investors, and strategic investors that invest in these types of companies. Ryan's practice concentrates on venture capital and corporate finance, mergers and acquisitions, equity and executive compensation matters, intellectual property development and licensing arrangements, SEC reporting and disclosure, public and private securities offerings, complex partnering arrangements, and general corporate matters. Welcome, Ryan. We thank also you. thank you. We also have with us Gadiel Morantes from Early Growth Financial Services. In addition to being a partner at Early Growth, Gadiel is an accomplished executive with 15 plus years of sales, marketing, and operating experience. His vast experience, both as an entrepreneur and working extensively with founders, has given him great insight into what it takes to forge strong partnerships and build successful companies. Gadiel is also an advisor and mentor for Spartups, a startup accelerator, and an active member of Founders Network. Welcome, Gadiel. Thanks, Gina. No problem. Oops, excuse me. And before we get started, I was hoping that each pre presenter could tell us a little bit about their prospective companies. So, Ryan, if you could start and tell us a little bit about Stubbs and Alderton. Sure. Thank you very much, Dina, and um, thank you, everyone, for joining today. Uh, so, yeah, I'm a partner with Stubbs, Alderton, and Markley's. We're a uh, Southern California-based law firm, a full-service business and technology law firm. Uh, we, we focus in working, uh, doing corporate transactional work, a wide range of that work for uh, companies of all sizes, but uh, but particularly earlier stage companies to middle market companies. Um, and in addition to the corporate transactional work, we provide uh, uh, additional legal services, with litigation, intellectual property, and uh, tax advice as well. Great, thank you. And then Gadiel, could you tell us a little bit about early growth? And I'm uh, Gadiel Morantes with early. Uh, I'll be jumping in. Sorry, Gina. Uh, Gadiel Morantes with Early Growth Financial Services. We work with companies of all stages, providing them with accounting support, everything from the day-to-day -day transactional accounting on an outsourced basis, CFO consulting services, tax preparation services, and 409A valuations. Uh, we help companies that are newly funded up through, you know, from a tech perspective, uh, a B round, C round type companies. Many of those leverage our services. We are headquartered in Silicon Valley, San Francisco, and are, have a, a physical presence in nine different markets throughout the U.S. L.A., Seattle, Boulder, Austin, Chicago, Las Vegas, and New York. And uh, I run the business development team for the organization and am out there talking to a lot of early stage tech companies, investors, and other uh, folks in the ecosystem. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, with that being said, why don't we go ahead and jump right in? Great. Thanks, Gina. So um, we're, you know, here we're going to cover um, essentially some key tips uh, that companies can take away on their way to fundraising and how to really attack getting that funding from a, you know, from venture capitalists, angel investors, and the such. So these are kind of what we like to call our quote unquote insider tips to get you really prepared and, and kind of get that strategy in order as you go out there and begin your roadshow and really start to push your company along. Next slide. Gina, we can jump to the next slide. Great. So as you start off, uh, the first point, so we'll back up one slide. Sorry about that. 
is really putting together and creating a game plan um, as you as you decide hey what does my organization need in order to t take it to that next level as uh, as companies start out many times it's you know one or two founders they've got an idea they start building a product so what does it mean to to go out there and get outside investment how much money do I need to raise I need to know exactly what that money is going to be used for when I raise my money you know what type of vehicle am I going to take and, and use whether it's a convertible note, an equity round of funding, maybe it's a friends and family round, um, what are the terms and conditions that are going to be wrapped around that? And then, you know, why is that going to be the best fit for my company? Many times we see that as being just the stage of the company that the company is at. You know, typically venture capitalists won't jump in at that initial round of funding when we're talking about raising, you know, fifty thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars. So a lot of times founders and entrepreneurs will will do what we call a friends and family round to get them up and running and off the ground at that point really to build that product, that, that MVP, and, and try to get um, a client base or a user base going into that. Um, and then, you know, from a fundraising perspective, and then also from, you know, after you've raised that money, what's that going to mean for your organization in terms of hitting certain milestones to really satisfy those investors that you've taken, taken on? Because now it's not only the founders who are measuring themselves against essentially their own idea of what a successful company will be but now they've actually got to produce some metrics to satisfy those outside investors and so many many times we call that milestone financing where I'm gonna hit certain milestones whether it's a user base or whether it's an actual revenue number in order to get my next tranche of money or my next tranche of financing going in so that's kind of some of the background and, and what we look for when you're creating the actual game plan. So it's doing a lot of introspective, you know, um, analysis and figuring out what it's going to take internally. What what am I going to have to um, go out there and present? Because that's the first thing investors are going to want to know. How much money are you raising? What are you raising it for? What are the milestones you're trying to achieve? Um, and then figuring out from there uh, where you're where you're headed. Um, Ryan, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I would just kind of reiterate much of what you said. I mean, when, when we sit, in da sit down and talk to startup clients, um, we kind of think of it, it's, it's a fundraising game plan. We'll often call it your fundraising strategy. So it involves, you know, what are those milestone, milestones along your, your lifespan of your company and thinking how much money you need to raise when and, and thinking about as an entrepreneur or a founder of the company, how that's going to affect you and your ownership going forward. So um, plan ahead. I guess is my short takeaway on that point, not just thinking about this immediate fundraising, but what you're going to need in the future so that you're setting yourself up properly. Great. And, yeah, so next slide, Gina. So go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so I was just going to pick up on the next slide. Uh, thanks, Gadiel. Um, one of the things that referenced on, on coming up with the game plan is, is the structure and type of the financing. So for when you're talking about your first round of outside financing into a company, whether that's a friends and family financing, a, a seed round, um, it could involve angel investors or even some you know, institutional investors or venture capital, there's two typical structures that you would see out there. One is convertible debt and the other is equity. Um, equity simply means someone's buying stock in your company at a fixed price per share which means that you have to have agreed on what the value of your company is and how much they're going to own for their investment. Um, a convertible debt, on the other hand, is not an immediate purchase of shares in the company, but rather it's an instrument, in this case a note, that ultimately the idea is is going to convert into stock into your company. Um, there's a couple reasons why, why you might choose as an entrepreneur to go with convertible debt uh, versus equity. Historically, there's been two real reasons. One is, you know, as I said, if you're if it's an equity investment, you're having to agree on what the valuation is. That's often really hard to do, especially when you're in the early stages of a company. As an entrepreneur, you think your company is very valuable, and you should think your company is very valuable. Um, investors might have a little bit of a different idea. And there's no real, you know, financial numbers or formulas to come up with on valuation. So you may be far apart, and that may be a difficult discussion to have. So one potential advantage of convertible debt is that it allows you to defer that discussion on what the exact valuation is and what 
percentage they're going to own of your company to a later point. Most often that later point is when you're raising an outside you know, venture capital round. Um, the, the other potential advantage of convertible debt is that it's generally viewed as simpler and less costly to get completed. Um, and that's for a number of reasons. The, the documentation is usually a little simpler to do, so less legal work to draft and prepare. The closing mechanics of it are a little simpler. And there's just, frankly, fewer terms that you have to negotiate with the investor. Um, there's a few key terms. You know, what, what are the conversion terms of that note? Um, is there going to be an interest rate? Uh, but there's there's three or four key terms. Other than that, it's, it's mostly standardized documentation. So it's a little more efficient to get that investment into your company. Um, now, both of those advantages, you might think everyone would always want to do convertible debt. Uh, there's sort of counter arguments on both pieces. One is on, on the cost and efficiency standpoint. You know, over the last couple of years, there have developed various sets of more or less standardized seed round financing documents that investors and companies have gotten used to using. Um, they're simplified and makes it much easier to do an early round financing, uh, equity financing. So that kind of reduces that advantage of convertible debt a little bit. And then the biggest thing is the valuation point. The way convertible debt has developed is that most investors, certainly sophisticated investors, are going to want a maximum conversion price or cap on what their note's going to convert at. In other words, they don't want to tie it simply to the next round and a small discount to that round. They want to have, know for certain that they're not going to convert over a certain price. Um, and so you're still having to agree at least on what that cap valuation is. Um, so the advantages aren't as great anymore the way things have developed. Uh, that said, you know, for first round financings, at least we're still seeing uh, more of them doing convertible debt uh, as opposed to an equity round, although it's it's not that much of a difference. We certainly see both of them quite often. Um, and then I guess yeah, to, I just to wonder, transition back okay, to you, do you have anything to add on that point? No, I, the only thing I wanted to add was you know, this is where having folks like you who have the experience in the tech space and really understand the advantages or your disadvantages or just alternatives essentially on what's what's commonplace because what what we see often is, you know, first time entrepreneurs go out there raising their first round of funding and not sure which direction to go. And then on the flip side, you know, having a, an investor who's not used to investing in tech companies so they're you know that maybe they're chasing an equity round right away and not understanding what the advantages or disadvantages are so consulting with um, you know obviously a firm like Stubbs who has a lot of that background experience and deals with this you know quite a few times you know in, in the course of the day in terms of so many of the clients you guys have are, are invested in and, and venture backed and stuff like that so that's why it's just important to always consult with your uh, corporate attorneys on this end that's all I had really okay Next slide. So, you know, from uh, obviously this this slide's you know dear to my heart, just as being a uh, business development uh, with my background in business development is really approaching fundraising efforts in in targeting VCs like uh, BD opportunity. Uh, um, so, what when I'm talking to companies, I'm always asking them, well. You know, at what point will you be going out and actually fundraising and actually talking to investors? And so, the key point on that that is, if I'm you know if I'm running out of money in five six months, then that that's your trigger of okay, well I got to start fundraising now because it really does take you that long to get those first checks in and and really get that first money in. So, really figuring out even six months before that is is starting to get your game plan in order in, in terms of getting your house in order on, on the company side, getting your financials ready, and then really starting to get those stepping, stepping stones in place for you. So determining your funding round, we kind of discussed that a little bit. Is this going to be a convertible debt round? Um, is it going to be an equity round of funding or even a friends and family round? What, what's that going to look like? How much money are we going to raise? And then really starting to formulate as an organization, what is my value proposition that I'm getting out there? Um, is it I've built a company and I've got 100,000 users and it's going to re be really easy for me to turn on the monetization of it or am I building an enterprise platform that's really going to be key to somebody's business? 
really figuring out that is going to be important so that you can start to communicate that with with the um, with the investors that you're going to be speaking with. Um, also, relying on your ecosystem for investor introductions. So this is key because what I'm finding as I talk to VCs and investors, I always ask the question, you know, where do you get your deal flow? Where do you find these interesting companies? And the answer I get a lot is, well, you know, we get a lot from our existing portfolio of, of founders and, and CEOs because they've got a great network of other founders and CEOs that they speak together. The, the startup ecosystem is actually a really small one and a very tight-knit one at the end of the day. I just had a conversation with a founder this morning coming in from, from Europe, and he's asking, you know, what's my, you know, what's the best avenue for me to get to and in front of VCs? And, you know, it's going through service providers a lot of times. You know, folks like Early Growth, we have a, a big network of investors that we work with frequently and we really try to target exactly what they look for and what types of companies they like to invest in but then you know and obviously Stubbs and Ryan have a, a great tight network of investors that they work with as well so that's one avenue and that kind of touches to selecting your key service providers but then the other avenue can really be the the founders ecosystem and the uh, the CEO ecosystem that you build and then it's really, you know, the next slide we'll talk a little bit more about this was really fine-tuning who are the folks you're going to target. Um, but to the point around evaluating and selecting key service providers, it's really understanding that, you know, if I'm a tech, technology company that's going to go out and raise VC funding, understanding that I'm going to work with partners who are familiar in that space. I work with a lot of and speak to a lot of startups, that, and I always ask them the question, well, who's your corporate attorney or who's your current accounting provider and they tell me that they're working with somebody who works with a lot of family owned businesses they're not really technology savvy or not um, in terms of that's not their clientele and my guidance and my advice in that front always tends to be well work with somebody who's really used to working in this ecosystem because they can add a lot of value not only with their knowledge base but also with the introductions they can make down the road and typically at this early stage, the service providers you're interacting with, are your corporate attorneys, uh, your banks, uh, accounting professionals, and then uh, if you have payroll or, or HR needs, the HR folks, the, and the, these, you know, the outsourced HR folks and outsourced accounting folks. We have a quick question for you guys. What are your thoughts on approaching an angel investor instead of a venture capitalist? I figured it may be better in my situation since I have my MVP, but I'm working on monetizing still. Yeah, I think um, I'll, I'll jump in there, Gadiel. And, and this kind of transitions into the next slide, actually, into point number four, um, which is labeled thoughtfully target VCs and applies to that. But it could you know, apply more generally to thoughtfully target your investors. I think the the most important thing is understand sort of what stage you are and uh, what investors uh, make more sense, are used to investing in companies of your stage, in your industry, et cetera. And if, if you're earlier stage and you think you're too early to go to venture capital firms, then yes, I would do what you can to exhaust, you know, angel investors that you know or might be in local networks where you're located geographically um, and, and utilize, you know, your network of of friends, of other entrepreneurs that you know, of your service providers, um, and you know, mine all those sources to try and find the investors that you think would that would work for your kind of company. And, and you get that kind of information. You can get a lot of that, especially if you're talking about VCs. You can get a lot of that information these days, easily publicly available. You know, whether it's through their website, other websites that talk about VCs, or through LinkedIn even. Um, if you're talking about other, you know, not as public investors or angel investors, get that through talking through your network, through your service providers. Um, you know, early growth and Gadiel have worked with lots of startups and, and worked with lots of investors and seen the companies they like to invest in so they can, they can help you formulate a plan for the best targets for that. And I don't know if you have anything yeah. to add to that, Gadiel. No, I think that's, you, you covered it really well, and I think that leads in, um, you know, into our next slide, essentially, which is 
really formulating and, and being thoughtful about targeting the the venture community in, in, in really precise ways. So that's identifying, you know, what type of company have I built? What does that look like? What types of investors are out there that are focused on that on that industry and in that space? So as we think about um, location is a piece of that, what stage am I at is another piece of that. So, you know, I'll give the example of Austin-based businesses and Austin-based VCs. A lot of them will only invest in Austin-based or Texas-based companies. So if I'm a company that's based in L.A. Or, or California, unless I plan on moving there, it's not really going to make a lot of sense for me to put a lot of effort into going out there, meeting these VCs, and, and delivering my value prop. Um, so really looking at, you know, all these venture firms have their websites, they have their portfolio companies listed. So really doing your homework can help your, you in targeting and being thoughtful about what VCs you're going to reach out to. But then it's also helpful to folks like me because, you know, as we manage our investor relationships and our VC relationships, now I'm not spinning my wheels trying to figure out who the investors are within my network that I could introduce you to as one of our clients. Um, and so that, that goes to all these areas, you know, whether it's the brand, the network, industry focus, and then also figuring out, you know, you got to remember as, as a company, what value is this particular VC going to give to my company? Because ultimately, it's one thing to write a check, but it's another thing to really leverage their community as well and their relationships as well to say they're going to be able to take me to the next level because they have such and such expertise. They know so and so that could be a potential partner to me. Things like that. That's why it's very important to identify, you know, it's, it's matchmaking on both sides and really identifying the key players. Ryan, anything there you want to add? Uh, the only thing I would add there is it's, you, you know, that, that's really important to target your potential investors, VCs or otherwise, and, and make sure you're not wasting your time or theirs. Um, and then also just to be in thinking about who you're going to target, think about what you know value they're going to bring to you as well. So if, if they have a particular industry focus and other portfolio companies that are going to be complementary to yours, that's great. On the other hand, if they're in your industry and they have already invested in one of your direct competitors, um, they're probably they're definitely not going to invest in you. So that's um, something to note as well. And quickly, guys, we have one more question. Great point. Oh, sorry. Um, Next quick, slide, Jim. Oh, just quickly, we have a question, and it says, most angel yeah. investors don't like cold emails. There are services such as LinkedIn, as you had mentioned. However, what would you suggest is the best way to approach? Can you guys hear yeah, me? I think from my perspective, I'll just jump in, Ryan. Yeah, I'll just jump in. Um, the, the best way to approach there is, you know, if you do have a service provider or if you do have, uh, you know, other founders that you know, um, ask them if they know that, that angel investor and, and ask for a warm introduction that way. I think, you know, LinkedIn as a tool is awesome because if you're connected to, to me or to Ryan, for example, and you see that we're connected to an angel investor, um, you know, leveraging us for that warm introduction goes a lot further than than just a cold email, uh, in my experience. Um, you know, frankly, I will ask you to do a little bit of homework and, and provide me, you know, whether it's a pitch deck, executive summary, or even a short blurb that I can tee up that introduction. But that's that's very much how I would approach it instead of going in cold. And also meeting them at events. That's another thing. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But Ryan, uh, anything to add to that? Yeah, I would, not so much to add, but again, just kind of, echo your point, you know, I think you really, to, to the exact point of the question is uh, you know, a cold call or cold email in most cases is not going to get you very far. Um, if you're talking about people who are active investors, whether they're active angels or VCs, you know, they're, they're getting tens or hundreds of inquiries every week or month. Um, so you have very little time unless you've got, you need every advantage you can and getting, as Gadiel said, a warm introduction from someone they know and trust uh, is going to go a long way um, and certainly really important. And, and when I mentioned LinkedIn, I got to explain it exactly the way I would, which is you should use that as a tool 
um, to see you know how people are connected and, and things like that. I wouldn't use that as your sort of mechanism to contact people um, on a cold you know cold email or cold message basis. Um, but it's a great way to find out information on who's connected to who and, and those kind of things. And this is transitioning again to our next slide. slide well, four, okay, and, and I'll transition. To that no, I, definitely. I Do you guys want me to hold off on the, the next two questions or until the end or? I'm no, go shoot. Are you, are you yeah, sure? go okay, for yeah. it. And, and then we'll just kind of pop right into the slide as soon as we're done. Um, it, the next question is saying, what do VCs look for before investing in a, in a company? We've tried several times with VC companies in the UK, but our experience has been very bad. Either they don't respond or they're looking for companies who have, uh, what does it say? Looking for companies that have more money, I believe, or I'm sorry, 10 million in revenue. What are your suggestions? Yeah, I'll jump in. Ryan, first, you want to I take guess. the first step? Sure. So I, I think this goes back to the earlier point. You have to you have to look at and find out what the investors are looking for for their investment. So each venture fund, for example, will have different criteria. Um, some might invest only in early stage deals, and if you're an early stage company, those are obviously the ones you want to go to. Some, as the question stated, might only invest in companies that are generating over a certain amount of revenue or past a certain point. They might only invest in certain industries, um, certain geographies, as Jody said earlier. So that's all part of doing your homework on those VCs. That said, if you meet their criteria for what they're investing in, you know there are some common things they look at, and you know I I would say based on experience, top of that list are you know how big is the opportunity, um, the team is really important to investors. So first you have to meet their basic investment criteria for their fund. And then you have to kind of check off the boxes of what of the things that are important to them as far as the actual opportunity. Awesome. Thank you, guys. And then the last question. You covered question. up beautifully. No, <laughs> you, nothing to add on my end. You did. That was very nice. Um, the last question we have before moving on to your work, your network, is what's your opinion on getting investor investment bankers involved in fundraising? That's a tricky one. I mean, I, you know, at the very early stages, um, if we're talking – you know, seed seed round, um, convertible note type of rounds. I don't see investment bankers getting involved uh, that often. I, I typically see that happening in later rounds. Um, you know, they can bring a lot of value and they have a lot of relationships. But you know, you got to remember too. Now, now you've got somebody to pay a fee, a fee to. So um, when we're talking about early technology companies. Frankly, I don't see investment bankers play a big role in that. Um, you know, what have you seen, Ryan? Yeah, I, I would completely agree with that. I think there there are not many investment bankers, or at least good ones, that would be able to help you on kind of your first round of financing. Um, and then when you get into your second, third round of financing, if you're raising it from venture funds, um, they're they're typically not going to want to go through an investment banker and have those fees paid out of their money. So it's really it's later on when you're a mature company or if you're engaging in you know, strategic transactions when investment bankers really come into play. Great. Well, uh, on that front, you know, working your network is is a very key key aspect, and and we've touched on a lot of these points already in terms of, you know, how do you how do you get in front of the right investors? So, you know, it, it's really about targeting the the folks that you want to talk to. And then, you know, networking with them. How do you get in front of them? So we're, we're talking about, you know, we've already talked about, you know, cold, cold, cold calling, cold reaching out, cold emailing is not a, good, not a good approach and not a good plan, but going the warm route. Or even going to, if a VC is on a panel or doing a presentation somewhere, going to that event, meeting them in person, and not doing the hard sell, because you can imagine it's almost like meeting a rock star out there or, or an athlete and asking them for their autograph right off the bat. It's If you really want to build a relationship, you kind of play it low-key, give them your business card. You know, They're very open a lot of times with you know, giving you their business cards and just asking them for advice and really starting to build a relationship. Um, I work with another, a number of founders who have really started building these many of these relationships a year out of even you know having completed their product or the, whatever their platform is because they want to be proactive about really building that relationship, asking the advice of the venture capital or the investor, and really taking that advice to heart 
and giving them updates because now you have a reason to reach back out to them and let them know how the company's coming along and how things are being built. Networking with other entrepreneurs is a very, very strong way to get in front of these investors. I already mentioned, you know, founders and CEOs are a tight-knit group. The technology space is really, really uh, a really helpful community. And so to be able to leverage other founders that have been funded before and asking them for warm introductions is fantastic. And then also, you know, working out of co-location places, incubators, going through incubators and accelerators, all those are really good ways as well because you, now you have a community of, of founders and now you have a community that many investors actually pop into. And Ryan, to that front, you know, Stubbs has the, the pre-accelerator program and I don't know if you'd want to talk about that at all, but, you know, that's another, you know, really tight-knit community and a way to add a lot of value. Yeah, yeah, thank you. We do. We have a pre-accelerator program, which is essentially a uh, – we provide out of our, our office in Santa Monica in Los Angeles uh, co-working space for you know five to eight startups at a time, um, and the idea is to give them a, exactly that kind of a community and help them start you know getting value also from the other startups there, and then we also help do whatever we can, and we invite people like investors or people like Yale to come in and meet the companies um, so that they can you know begin to reach out and build their network as well and get to their next stage, whether that's you know, raising their money, which is the goal for most of them, but not all of them, or, or getting into a, a more higher-end kind of accelerator program as a few of them have. So, but any of those kind of programs for exactly those reasons to help you kind of get involved in the community and, and build your network is great, are great. Um, you know, being around entrepreneurs that are going through the same kind of issues and meeting people that might be valuable to you is great. Next slide, Gina. So preparing for the meet, um, I, I think, you know, Ryan, why don't you take this one if you don't mind? Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so, so the idea here is, you know, you're, you've, uh, by the time you're meeting an investor, for the most part, if you're having a formal meeting with me, that you've already sparked some sort of interest for them that they're willing to take the time. Um, and, but you still are probably going to have a limited time. Maybe it's a half hour, maybe an hour if you're lucky. Um, so you want to be as prepared as possible. Uh, you this you know most likely it's going to be going through your pitch deck. Um, so you want to make sure that you've nailed that, you've <laughs> put as much work into that uh, as you can. Um, and not only that, but your presentation of that deck as well is really important. So you don't want to go into your first meeting not having practiced that many times. Um, and again, use your use your advisors and your service providers to help you. Um, you know, we will, and I'm sure Gaudio and his firm will too, sit down with you and do a dry run through your pitch deck. We've seen a lot of presentations and we know what kind of questions the investors are going to ask you. So we'll kind of, you know, help drill you and prepare you for those kind of questions. Um, and then the other piece of, the, of doing your homework is doing your homework on the investor you're pitching to. So it kind of goes back to reiterating some of the things you said before, but, you know, know what kind of businesses they're interested in and how they might add value to your firm and be able to bring that out in a conversation. Um, know if you fit in a complementary fashion within their portfolio. Know what you're going to ask for. So, you know, are, are you asking for money, how much money, and be able to answer the questions of what you're going to do with that money um, and how long it's going to last you. Be ready for whatever questions they can throw at you, and the more kind of practice you do on that, the better you'll get. Um, but again, it's kind of the old adage of, you know, you only get one chance to make a first impression. So, so you don't want to blow that up. So. That is actually my favorite quote. I love yeah, that you I just agree used with that. You more there and, and... <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Gaddy, and then I'll proceed Fantastic. with the question. Okay, great. No, I mean, I, I think I just want to reiterate uh, practice, 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 and just doing doing that all the all the upfront work to make sure that once you get that audience that you're really prepared for it so um, we'll talk a little bit more about that kind of down the road but go ahead with the question so we have the question I forgot the correct term to use but there's something to look for in an investor to make sure they can legally invest what's that called and where can I find fi find that in an investor I believe they have to have over a hundred thousand in assets so yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. So uh, I'm 
believe you're probably referring to them being an accredited investor, and that's for securities law purposes. Um, for in most cases, you're going to want all your investors to be accredited investors under the securities laws. That generally, the definition for that, if it's an individual, are that they have to have a million dollars of net worth. Um, that's excluding their primary residence. Um, or they have income of at least $200,000 or more than $300,000 with their spouse if they're married. Um, so those are the basic requirements. Uh, just like every other legal issue, there's exceptions to that rule that everyone has to be accredited, but in the you know, vast majority of cases, you want everyone to be accredited. So. Perfect. Thanks. Good. Gadiel, do you have anything to answer before or add before I move on to the next slide? No, that's perfect. All right. Let's move on then. So creating your executive summary. So, you know, this is something that we typically see. It's just a typical one, one pager that you can share, which really identifies and, and gives a good snapshot of the company. And it's something that's really easy to share with the investors, with, you know, other founders. Um, and it's really a tool that, you can condense everything that you have on a one sheet. So you're identifying the problem, solution, and opportunity that your company and what you're building is trying to accomplish. Really putting this in your voice. Um, you don't have a, a lot of opportunity to do this, but this is a, a way where you can be, you know, the formatting is pretty tight as, as we'll talk about the pitch deck as well, but really communicating, you know, in, in showing and sharing your passion for your idea. If you can do this in the written form, then this is a great avenue to do this. And then what's your end goal? You know, if you're fundraising, how much money are you trying to attract? Uh, what's going to be the purpose of it? What are you going to do? So, you know, I, that's a lot of information that you're trying to put on one sheet, but it's it's trying to essentially give somebody a snapshot of who the company is, what you're trying to accomplish, what the next steps are, and really communicating why is this a good idea and why are you doing this in the first place? That's that's what we, we see in an executive summary and that's something that, you know, we've got a template that we often share with many of our clients um, as they build out theirs, you know, because investors also are very keen on wanting to see, you know, the same thing in terms of the same format over and over um, from an executive summary as well as a pitch deck uh, uh, format. Ryan, do you do you yeah. often look at these? Yeah, absolutely. I've, and uh, I I think I don't have much to add. I think you uh, you hit all the high points. Um, the bottom line is with your executive summary, you want to get their intent attention and get them interested so that they have follow up questions to ask you. And that leads right into the next slide, which is you know per, creating the perfect pitch deck. So. You know, here at Early Growth, we've actually worked with and, and done a number of webinars um, around creating the perfect pitch deck. And we actually have an investor, a VC, a micro VC uh, in Silicon Valley, who has helped us in, in talking through how do you build, um, you know, how do you build the perfect pitch deck? And essentially, the format, you know, tends to th stay the same. And we've given you an idea of kind of the slides here. And I'll, talk, I'll, I'll just pull out a, c a couple that you know are, are particularly important. Obviously, I think Ryan mentioned this earlier. What is the market opportunity? You know, how big a market is it that you're trying to capture? Because from an investor standpoint, the bigger the market, um, the more the more attractive it can be. Um, you know, you, you narrow in on you know who 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 out there is is building the same type of technology. Who my competitors are. From our perspective, obviously being the accounting firm, you know the financial slide is is very key um, to what you're building. And so building, you know, some financials, putting a financial model together, and really sharing with the investors, you know, if I get a million dollars, where's that going to take me? How many users am I going to acquire? Um, where will I get my business? And then also, you know, as I'm burning, you know, using this money where's the money being spent? So you're going to capture all this information in your financial slide, so that's going to be key. Um, Ryan, I'll let you identify a couple of slides that, that you guys uh, really highlight on. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, uh, the, the identifying the problem, 
that you're solving early on in your first or second slide so that people can clearly get a message of what it is that you're solving, right? And what it is that's great about your business and your opportunity and so that they're kind of sucked into your presentation and paying attention. I think that's vitally important. Um, and then I think the management team is hugely important and obviously you should have a slide here that highlights what your relevant experience is, whether that's as the, the co-founders themselves or if you're supplementing that with the advisor board. Um, but a huge part of what investors are investing in um, is the team and the people behind it, um, even more so sometimes than the business. Um, and then just overall, you know, again, just work on this, work on this. You're going to reiterate your pitch deck many times. As you want to keep it as short as and concise as you can. Um, you know, on the slide here, there's 10 different slides. If you can have a pitch deck that's 10 slides, that's great. Um, maybe 12, maybe 14 max. Uh, you don't want it to be any much longer than that. Um, and, and each slide should be clean and should kind of speak for itself. Um, obviously, you'll have to add color to it if you're speaking with someone in a meeting, but it should convey the message on its own. Um, I think those things are, are really important just to, to work those through. And, and there's lots of resources you, you can get out there to see how to build a pitch deck. Um, of course, you should use you know, your, your advisors and service providers. As Gadiel mentioned, they have a template they'll share. Um, but you can find resources yourself online. You know, Sequoia Ventures has their published their sample pitch deck. Angel groups like locally here in Los Angeles, the Tech Coast Angels have a sample um, deck that they publish. Um, but you know, you can't spend too much time uh, getting a pitch deck just right. It's 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 going to send the message to your investor and either either suck them in and to get their attention or confuse them. <laughs> That's exactly right, and it's it's funny. One of the when we make an introduction to investors or potential investors, the first thing we ask a company to provide us is an executive summary and a pitch deck, and you know many times we'll forward that on to pique their interest. And so, I was talking to one one investor, and he's like, if I see anything that doesn't look like the standard pitch deck uh, with the standard slides or executive summary, I, I almost you know it, it's almost hard for me to just readjust to that. So. I'd rather them wow me with something different in the meeting than to try to wow me over an e email pitch deck and executive summary. So next slide, Gina. I mean, I think I, I, I think we can't beat this this over the head anymore, right? Is really understanding and and knowing what your story is and communicating it and practicing it and and really fine tuning it moving forward. I think it's really knowing what your business is inside and out, um, trying to deliver and really share that passion that you have for your idea and for your company, it's hugely important. Having the, the background and really understanding the numbers to it because, you know, and any, any good investor and smart investor is going to, before they write you a check, they're going to want to know where, where that money is going to go. And what's their return going to be at the end of the day? You know, as you're building this company, um, you know they don't want to blindly write checks. Um, but also knowing that along the way, as you're practicing this, that you're going to get plenty of objections and you're going to get plenty of of, uh, of back and forth and, and dialogue around your business idea. Why is it? A, you know, what, you have to be able to def have it defensible and really understand the ins and outs of what you're building. So it's that preparation that's key. And then really being able to listen to the to community around you and, and the folks that you have around you as your trusted advisors. And I think Ryan's spoken to this quite a bit, is understanding and leaning on folks like, like Ryan, on folks like us at Early Growth, um, your business partners on, on, you know, how am I proceeding with my idea and my vision? Is this really something that I'm pushing forward in the appropriate way, in the right way. I think all of those things are key in telling the story and really understanding the story that you want to tell in the first place. Ryan, do you have anything? Yeah, I mean, just one thing I would add here, just as kind of a side note, is both in your pitch materials and in your presentations, um, one common thing that that we've seen a lot, and I, I think is 
not effective is that people will focus too much on their product and explaining their product and its features and, and what they've built, which really what you should focus on is your business and the opportunity. So, you know, it's hard to do that as an entrepreneur because you spend so much time thinking about it and perfecting it in day to day on what you're working on, but you have to kind of step back and look at it from an outsider investor perspective and boil down, you know, how you communicate what it is that you, you've built or are building into a couple of sentences that make it clear to someone to understand and, and instead really focusing on what's the opportunity of, of why they have to invest in your company and not miss out on the millions of dollars and billions of dollars that you're going to make them. I think that's a that's a great point, Ryan, and, and, and something that you know, I know many of the founders that we work with and entrepreneurs, you it's almost like you fall in love with your own idea, right? And then and then forget the bigger picture or don't pay attention to that bigger picture. So I think that's an excellent point to bring up. All right, and the number ten, the last uh, last kind of tip is, you know, following up. Uh, um, really, you know, looking at this, you know, back to the point about, you know, having this as kind of a business development opportunity and understanding that, you know, when you have an investor reading the signs, when you have an investor on the hook, you know, make sure you stay on their radar. Make sure you give them periodic updates. Really, you know, focus on, on you know, staying relevant and top of mind. Um, and, I, you know, I, I know we tell our companies and try to do this ourselves just on the, on the sales side is, you know, if there's interesting, you know, articles out there or, or updates about your company or things that you have going on, you know, giving those updates and sharing those, it's just an excuse to communicate to the investor and with the investor as you're going along this process. So um, not being annoying uh, and finding that balance, though, is, is pretty, uh, it, it can be hard to do, but it's something that can be pretty important moving forward. Yeah, I, I agree with you that with, you know, all those sentiments, um, you, you definitely want to follow up, but also have to, to read uh, when someone's not interested and, and avoid kind of being the pest. Um, and and keep in mind that you will get uh, either no response or a no or a no response from the vast majority of potential investors you talk to. Um, and it's actually really nice uh, when investors aren't interested and they just tell you that up front um, because what you'll find is there are a lot of investors who think that's sort of interesting. Um, and they'd like to just stay in touch, even though they're probably never going to invest, and it ends up kind of being a waste of your time as the entrepreneur. So um, getting an early no from people can also actually be really valuable to you, and you shouldn't always be discouraged by that. Great. Well, that's kind of the presentation. Gina, what are we uh, looking at for questions here? I was just going to say, we have no questions at this moment. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to type them in. If not, we'll kind of wrap things up. It obviously brings us to the end of the presentation. So thank you all for joining us, joining us today. We really appreciate your time and hope you found this useful. Again, if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to email us or tweet us to at earlygrowthfs, hashtag VC believe. And we did have another question saying, you know, will we be sharing this? Yes. Yeah, so you guys will get a link to the static deck as well as the recording. And you can also find this presentation on our YouTube page. Um, one quick question before we go is they have a question on pitch decks and, and, and that's it. So if you could be more in depth about your question on pitch, pitch decks. Okay. VCs always stress the importance of the management team. Should it be, should it really be at the end of the deck instead of the beginning? I would say, I'll jump in real quick and then, Gadiel, you can add to it. I, I would say if that's a strength of your team, you have a great team, there's nothing wrong with putting that near the front of the deck, in my personal opinion. Completely agree. Yeah. Perfect. Well, then that's it for questions so far. Again, this will be emailed out to all of you tomorrow. If you do have any follow-up questions, please feel free to tweet us at earlygrowthfs, hashtag VCBelieve. And you're also more than welcome to join us for our next free webinar tomorrow, Accounting for Startups, What You Need to Know with Cirque Rowe of Early Growth Financial Services, or again on Thursday, Startup Seed Funding from Bootstrapping to Equity Finance with 
again, Cirque Rowe from Early Growth Financial Services, and Christine DiBaccio of Fenwick & West. To register for these or any of our other free webinars, please feel free, to, feel free to visit us at our events page at earlygrowthfinancialservices.com backslash events. Thank you again for joining us today. We hope to connect with you all again soon. And thank you to Ryan and Gadiel for an amazing presentation. Thanks, Gina. And thanks, Ryan. Yeah, thank, thank you. you, everyone. Thanks, guys. Have a great day.